Millennium Actress is amazing. Satoshi Kon is one of the most revered directors in anime. Perfect Blue, Paprika, Tokyo Godfathers, Paranoia Agent, three episodes of the 90s JoJo miniseries. This guy is known for his directorial style that to this day is still really unique. Like, there are a lot of anime directors I like. Uh, Saito Kaichiro of Bochi the Rock and Free Run is a perfect example. But I don't know he's the director just from watching the product. There are very few directors who leave their mark on a project as much as Satoshi Kon. And it's his style that makes his films and shows so fascinating to me. Each of them are worth watching in their own right. Except for maybe the 90s JoJo's miniseries because I haven't seen it. But the one that I love the most is 2002's Millennium Actress. Millennium Actress is a look back at Japanese cinema through the lens of fictional actress Fujiwara Chiyoko. At the turn of the millennium, Jinae's studio is being demolished and director Genya Tachibana decides to make a documentary, honoring the studio where he got his start. A big part of the studio's history was its show era star Chiyoko, so naturally he interviews her in the process of filming the documentary. The bulk of the movie is this interview. We are reliving Chiyoko's life in the movies alongside her. A common element throughout Satoshi Kon's work is the subjectiveness of the camera. In a lot of anime, what you see is what you get. The camera is objective in the narrative. And that's fine. Most of the time, you don't want the camera's subjectivity to distract from the story that you're telling. I want to enjoy Kaiju number 8 without having to think about whether what I'm seeing is actually what's happening. However, Satoshi Kon's works are often about perception and reality. For example, Perfect Blue is tackling parasocial relationships and the difference between how we perceive ourselves and how others perceive us. The camera messing with us furthers the ideas and themes of the movie, and elevates it to something special that arguably became more relevant in our era of social media. The subjective camera in Milan Actress isn't as adversarial as it is in Perfect Blue. It's not there to make you think about what even is real, but to demonstrate the subjective nature of what we are watching. A woman's reflection on her own life. There are two sides of Millennium Actress. One is the celebration of Shoah-era cinema, while the other is a love story of a young actress chasing the shadow of a man she barely knows. And this is where I get into spoilers. If you want to watch this movie, it's on Crunchyroll, and I highly recommend it. This video will still be here after you're done, and then you can comment whether it was terrible or whether you really enjoyed it. Um, if you're a physical media person, there's a beautiful steelbook that is from G-Kids that I like. I I'm a physical media person. A um, bunch of Blu-rays and books down there. Uh, hi, post-production me. Just wanted to point out that apparently Millennium Actress is free on Tubi and YouTube. Uh, a little hard to see there, but that, that is what that is saying. So, um, yeah. If you didn't want to watch it on Crunchyroll or buy the beautiful Blu-ray, um, you can watch it for free. With ads, of course, but free is free. So anyways, uh, back to the video. We start in earnest in the late 1930s. For some context, this is probably after China and Japan have entered a full-scale war in 1937, and for lack of a better word, Japan has been going through some shit politically in the last decade. Three failed coup attempts, a rising nationalist movement, and by the end of the decade, the military has fully taken over control of the government and dissolved the political parties. This is the setting Shoko is approached by the director of Janae Studios. He talks about how she would be doing her nation a service by acting, that it's her national duty, that it's for the good of the soldiers fighting in China. It's showing the attitude of the day, even if it's devoid of the context history affords us. We know how unethical the Japanese military was at the time, but the general public of the day would have been getting the ultra-nationalist side of the story and wouldn't have the full context. A good litmus test of a country's attitude towards a war is the attitude of its children. They're just far more likely to say it as they see it. And Chiyoko wants to support the soldiers by acting. We're next introduced to her love interest, a mysterious painter and political fugitive who gives her a key during their brief meeting. And the police chasing after him, who we're going to call Scarface because that's what Mal has him listed as. 
the love interest is listed as Man of the Key, which is just a bad name, so we're going to call him the Painter. These two are an interesting pair when looking at Shioko's nationalist leaning. Despite her belief, she makes the gut decision to protect the Painter by lying to Scarface. The Painter is an interesting figure because we know next to nothing about him. We don't see his face, he's wearing clothes that hide his build, we don't really even know his skin tone. The movie takes different tones for each of its eras in film. And in this section, it's almost like you got rid of blue and green from an RGB color space, and turned the red down to 10%. This is the only time we get a really good look at the painter, and it's in this warped color space. We're not really perceiving what's happening here. We can't see his face because Chiyoko can't remember it. One of the interesting parts of this movie is that the love story really isn't a love story. There is no romance between the two, just Chiyoko chasing the idea of the painter as she moves up in the world of film. The consistent through line between how the films are presented to us is in her quest to reunite with the painter. It's a very romanticized look at this period of her life. The narrative of the movies she's playing in melding with her reality to create a complete narrative. However, this is similar to how she doesn't remember the painter's face. She's losing the fine details as the films in her real life mix. During this section, Genya Tachibana, the director of the documentary, starts taking on supporting roles, both in the literal sense and as a supporter in Shioka's stories. Now, he makes great comedic relief in what would otherwise be a pretty summer story, but it's hard to say exactly what he's filling in for in Shioka's story. My personal interpretation is that he represents the people who were undoubtedly supporting her in the industry. You don't get big just off of talent. You need connections. It doesn't fully explain some aspects of his roles, how he's often an enabler or protecting her from harm, which wouldn't really be an in industry context roles, but they do fit the role he eventually takes later on, so it works. This section is also fascinating in how it pays homage to cinema. We get nods to classic Akira Kurosawa movies like Throne of Blood, Ron, Yojimbo, and Seven Samurai. Kenji Misumi's The Tale of Zaituichi, Hideo Oba's What Is Your Name, Godzilla, and 2001 A Space Odyssey. And I'm definitely missing a few. I have no clue what the opening movie is referencing, if it's even a specific reference. It might just be a nod to the styles and themes of wartime films that didn't survive to the present day. Parts of that era of film history was lost in the wake of World War II. The films are also laid out in an interesting way. We start with war-era films that depict the era moving to samurai films and progressively getting more and more modern as we see depictions of a modernizing Japan, until we get back to the war era. However, it's much harder to tell what is even real when we get there. When the movies that Shioko was starring in looked different from her life, it was easy to tell the difference between the two. However, it's really hard when her life looks like the movies that she's in. There's a scene where Scarface catches Chiyoko and throws her in prison. This scene's plausible, but while in prison, we see Shimao Eiko, another actress at Janae Studios that is a reoccurring actress in the films Chiyoko is starring in. We're in a scene from another of her films. Then Tachibana, taking the role of a wealthy man, bails Chiyoko out, but the police say it doesn't really matter anyways because they've already caught the painter, who was who they were actually after. So are we in a film? Chiyoko sees them take him to a tunnel, and she bangs on the door until it opens and chases after him without hesitation, leading us to a destroyed Tokyo during a bombing. We're now in the middle of World War II. Now that kind of transition usually indicates that we're going from a film to the real world or vice versa, but we are clearly watching real events right now with the bombing of Tokyo. You wouldn't be making a cinematic movie during an actual bombing. So what's going on? We're seeing Shioko's memory pushed to the limit, the lines between reality and film blurring further and further. We only know that the artist really was captured and subsequently killed because of a second narrator. Scarface came to Janae Studios to apologize and confessed to Tachibana after Chiyoko ran off in a panic after seeing him. As we enter the second half of the movie, we see more of the interpersonal connections of Shioko's life. But while at first they seem real, they quickly blend into the films. We're still reliving a mix of half-remembered events and the films that were being shot contemporaneously. We, the viewers, don't know if any of this actually happened or not. 
But even if it didn't, it paints a clear picture of what she was going through during this period of her life. Coming to the realization that the painter might be gone. Her mother brings the topic to the forefront. She starts to process it and give it some real thought once she loses the key, and gives in when she realizes she can't remember his face. Even if the narrative Shoko paints isn't always accurate, it does paint a clear picture. She was chasing a dream that never existed. You can look at each of the events in Shoko's life as a cycle of a lead, a chase, and then a fall. She is constantly repeating the cycle over and over again. If we're not chasing something real, we're bound to trip and fall as well. Uh, thanks for watching. If you're still here and haven't seen this movie, you should probably go do that. It's great. It's one of my favorites of all time. Um, again, it's on Crunchyroll. Might as well go watch it. It's fairly easy to access. Uh, sorry it's been a minute since my last video. Life happened, and the last couple projects didn't really pan out. Uh, I was going to touch on everything that happened in VTubing since the start of the year, but I also don't want to kick a horse when it's down, and I think that the topic is so charged and heated that any attempt at finding nuance in it is not going to go over well. Uh, if you know, you know. Uh, I might do a retrospective when things cool down, but they haven't really, so I'll just wait and see. Uh, next video is probably on Carol and Tuesday, but re-watching that whole show while taking notes is taking way longer than it should have, so you might get something else in between the two. Uh, anyways, have a good one. See ya.